looks like she's asleep. That's good. Maybe not. She's all locked up inside herself. Yeah, well... I tried to talk to her earlier. No go, eh? No, I couldn't get anything out of her at all. I don't know what happened to her, but whatever it was, they really screwed her up. They must have found her weak spot. What, Ebony? Everybody has one. It's a Room 101, the place where their deepest fears exist. Welcome to Series 2, Episode 28 of Conversation Eagle Mountain, a podcast about the tribe. I'm your host, Lance, and joining me on the podcast panel today is Liz. Hello. Sabine. Hi. And Maggie. Hi. We have episode notes done by Matt and myself. So Series 2, Episode 28, the screenplay was done by Anthony Reed. It was directed by Colin McCall. And the episode synopsis we read out by Liz. Tyson tries to get through to Ebony, who has been scarred by her experience and continues to have flashbacks to her treatment by Zoot. Chloe and Patsy are impressed by Dal's bravery after he's attacked by the gulls. But the escalating tensions in the city could soon put all the mall rats in danger. I just want to say off the bat that I think Anthony and Colin did a fantastic job with this episode. I, I think the writing is really sharp. Dialogue is good. Um, and I really like the direction. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to say that. A plus, guys. Well done. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Having returned to the mall, Tysan tries to comfort Ebony when she has had a bad dream, but Ebony is unable to respond. Um, and we, yeah, we've talked quite a lot about um, our feelings concerning Tysan's reaction to Ebony after the attempted murder. But what do you make of the extent of Ebony's trauma? Like, considering how long she was in captivity, do you think that it was justified or was it overplayed? Like, what are your thoughts on it all? I think it was justified for people with, PTSD, and that's what this is looking like. It does not take much to trigger memories and to trigger that response again. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't even think it's about what Spike did to her. Mm. Um, I don't think that's what she's traumatized by. She's traumatized because Spike tapped into a past mm-hmm. trauma mm-hmm. of hers, you know, and that's where she she's broken. He brought that back. Think about it. She's not having a nightmare about Spike. She's having a nightmare about Zoot. That's what, that's the egg that got cracked. The thing that yeah. was buried deep. And, um, I, I don't think it, it's overdone because again, if it was only what Spike did to her, I would feel like, I think Ebony's probably been through a little worse than this, but because it's not about what Spike's doing to her and it's something far more psychologically deep than that, just that he managed to trigger it. I think this is an appropriate response considering uh, it's telling you the gravity of how bad this trauma was for her. Yeah, I definitely, yeah. I, I agree with all of that as well. You know, it's, it's, it's very fitting and um, it is very telling about, you know, how she became to be who she was in the locos. Uh, and then, you know, like she used that trauma to be I guess stronger and she was never going to, you know, let herself be that weak person again. And here she is. Everything's, you know, pulling back to the surface it's kind of nice to see that vulnerability in her it's ebony we don't get that very often and um it kind of it kind of tells us a little bit more you know or a lot more about her character who she is and how she became to be who she is and why she is the way she is Uh, it was very nice to you know i don't want to say it's nice to see because it sucks you know she's so traumatized by all of this but it was very well written, and, and, and I think Meryl did an awesome job portraying that. I wanted to ask you guys, um, now when she wakes up from her nightmare, and the way she responds physically to Tysan, that she can't even accept Tysan's comfort, like she lets herself do it for a split second, and then next thing you know, she's pushing away, creating a distance, and even holding up a barrier between she and Tysan, who is only trying to comfort her. And it made me You know, I thought it was a very good illustration of her attachment disorder that she has with people. Um, Either she's absolutely terrified to form an attachment or when she does, it's a very, uh, sorry, what's the word, Uh, insecure attachment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's why we see the way she gets obsessed with her romantic partners and is very insecure about how they feel about her and will sabotage the relationship in the end, you know, all that stuff. 
But I wanted to ask you guys, what what do you think is the actual trauma here? Do you think it's the idea of the abandonment, the idea that Zoot was going to leave her in the dark where no one would find her, no one would care about her, and that's, you know, what Spike triggered? Or do you think the trauma is that Zoot basically punished her for having a vulnerability? Ooh. I think it's a combination of both, yes, really. It's got to be. Because, you know, if, if you think about how she was introduced, suddenly transferring, her life changing, not the most stable of family histories, and then just, you know, being abandoned by everyone, the adults, everyone she cared for. Right. And that combined with the fact that Zoot told her she wasn't to show emotion. Yeah. She was not allowed to be vulnerable because being vulnerable meant she was weak. And, and she was unworthy. Yeah, that she was unworthy of, you know, being his woman. And she got that idea so stuck in her head that she just couldn't see those things separately again. I mean, she instantly relates being vulnerable to being weak due to everything in her past. And yes, be, be, the idea of being abandoned makes her vulnerable, and she's been taught that that's a sign of weakness. And yeah, her best coping mechanism is just to keep everyone at bay. Yeah. If you don't let them in... Can't hurt you. If you just make sure... Yeah, if, if they don't see it, they can't use it against you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And she is always about that reputation of hers, you know, that holding yeah. that, that, that strong uh, resolve. Um, so I think, and I, and at the same time, like, I wonder if her pulling away from Tysan like she did, you know, is because out of everybody, how could she let Tysan see that vulnerability mm -hmm. after everything that they, you know, they went yeah. through. Um, but at the same time, she's so far into her head. How does she, does she even realize, you know what I mean? That it is Tysan. You know, is she is she putting those those thoughts together because of the state that she's in? You know, um, I, I I don't think she is exactly. You know, like I don't think that's what she's thinking about. But it's it is really tough because I feel like both of those things are a driving factor as to why Ebony is the way she is. Her response to Tyson is so visceral. It's almost like. She has her chest open and she's expecting Tyson to stab it at the yes. first opportunity. Yeah. And I, I don't think she's putting two and two together like, oh, it's Tyson. I mm -hmm. shouldn't trust her. I should, you know, I, I think yeah. you guys are right that it's not even about Tyson. I think she would have responded to anyone that way. Um, this actual physical fear that you'll hurt me if, you know, because you're seeing me this way, you know. And I was looking at, now I don't believe Zoot's the first person who put this idea in her head. No. No. I believe that she was brought up in a home that uh, this was reinforced to her and her sisters because they all have this same psychological problem yeah. in many ways. Uh, so, but I do think he was a cam the straw that broke the camel's back, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I'm sure in her past she was punished for showing vulnerability and weakness, but not to the extent of what Zoot was willing to do to her um, for being afraid, for begging, for, you know... Because she was so stubborn and so determined not to show him that, you know, at first. And that's like somebody put that in her head that she's not supposed to. And um, mm -hmm. so I think it was just this culmination. And like you point out, Sabine, all the trauma of the virus anyway on top of that. And say what you want about the Locos, they were the only place she belonged. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was all she had, you know. She did feel abandoned by everyone. It's not a fair assessment, but that is how she felt. And then for him to do this to her, you know, yeah, it's just a two punch. Just, yeah, you got to disassociate at some point. Mm. And Zoot really set her, set her up for failure in that situation, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was no winning on, on her part. That kind of manipulative abuse breaks people. Like, it's hard. It's bad enough when your abuser sets the stakes so high that it's hard for you to win but there's at least a chance you know that you could mm -hmm. but he said you can't win you know even she's aware in this game i can't win she even says if i beg i wouldn't be good enough to be your woman and he looks at her like yeah good luck with that you know what i mean and so it's like that's even more emotionally traumatizing because it's just like you don't even want me to win so what am i supposed to do here 
down. And yeah, if, if I think about it, because yeah, her response to Tyson just seems like her basic instinct telling her, no, I can't show this, just move away. But it also, if we think about it, it makes so much more sense how much she hates Trudy later on, or well, all the time, because Zoot put her through all this. She would never be good enough, no matter what she tried. And then there was Trudy who didn't have to try. Not to mention, Trudy is like the very definition of vulnerability. Yeah, and she exactly. Not, she's not punished for it. No, Zoot she's would not. never have yep. punished her for that. She's yeah. cared for. She's actually given the care that you deserve when you're in a yeah. bad place. You know, that's what the people around her want to do. Cradle her, you know, and, and it's just yeah. like, and what the frick is so special <laughs> about her? <laughs> in, in comparison, yeah. I get why Ebony is pissed off. No, and then, and then you also, you know, you think about the fact that Bray was the one that helped Trudy get away from the locos. Yeah. Bray is the one that helped, you know, and Ebony wanted Bray. She's always wanted Bray. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's such yeah, a Yeah, and she's always thing. wanted to win. Yeah, exactly. And then she didn't win, you know? She didn't feel like she won. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's always in her head because I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. Yeah. I mean, you meet the, she meets the guardian and these guys are all set. They want Trudy. They're all set to worship mm -hmm. Trudy. And yet look at how they treat Ebony, who was by Zoot's side. And they speak so despairingly about her. Yeah. You know, and it's just like Zoot, it, Trudy rejected Zoot, but you still want her. What is so special about her? You know, and it's just a reflection of what she feels she's already lacking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. I get it. Totally mm -hmm. understand. It's not fair to Trudy, but no. I know why she hates her so much. Yeah. I, I mean, with the information we've now been given, it makes sense from Ebony's point of view. Still not very nice, but it makes sense. I love everything you guys are saying. I love the whole trauma scenes. It's just the one bit that I really hated, that obviously we'll come to in a bit later, is the fact that it was... Bray that yes. helps snap her out of it. Yeah. Yes. Oh my god, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> Why do you have to do that to suddenly snap her out of the just trauma? Literally like, oh. just yeah, no, yep. <laughs> it was disappointing, but yeah, we'll come to that in a second. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's let's move on to the big fallout because um with bad feeling towards the mall rats building in the city, Dara races back to the mall to tell the others of an attack he's had by the previously friendly goals. Dal, take it easy. Dal, what's going on? The ghouls attacked me. Um, yeah, Panna, what did you make of Dal being attacked? You didn't have to knock over the whole dang thing of milk. <laughs> they, oh, they, that, that's what annoys me the most. I'm like, just lift the lid off. Just lift the lid yeah, off. Yeah, and plus, they flip the lid. I mean, they flip everything. These city kids, they've been starving for ages. Why would they waste food and let all those crops lay there on the floor? We're just angry, you know, when kids, I guess, you know, when teenagers get riled up, they just think about that one thing, you know? Yeah, uh, but but these have been, these are kids that have been living on barely anything. We don't know if they went back and took it, though, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, we'll grab the lettuce. <laughs> yes, lick the milk up, it'll be fine. I would have liked to just one, I'd love one reaction shot from just one gull who saw that it was food, they just wasted and be like, oh man. Yeah, me too, mm -hmm. right? Like, you should have just really, taken that. I was really looking forward to that milk. Right. I haven't had cereal in ages or whatever. I just, that would have been great. Just one of them yeah. looking quite upset that they had done that. Like, ah, crap. It really was yeah. food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus, they could have taken that food. Jack is a, I don't know. <laughs> I have words about Jack that I can't say <laughs> on this podcast. Um... <laughs> What a butthead! Like how? What? Mm. Ellie just tell him to knock it off. Like she needs to just be like, he's your friend. Mm -hmm. Being jealous, like just tell him you are being jealous. Don't ask him if he's being jealous. Tell him. Like he he gets away with acting this way, and I it just drives me crazy because people still are like, Dal and Jack are best friends. Not anymore, they're not. <laughs> it took a girl. It took a little blind girl to prove that wrong. Like, mm -hmm. oh, Jack. I just remember, like, Ellie comes back and he makes a big fuss of her checking on Dal. And instead of saying, of course I checked on him, he's one of our tribe mates and he's my friend. She just says, oh, well, I had to get the story. Like, didn't care that he got hurt. 
And then you have Jack, who also <sighs> just does not yeah. care. The doubt has literally been attacked. He didn't trip. You know what I mean? Like, he was attacked, you guys. He's out there. Does it not concern anybody that the reason he was able to be attacked is because he's been left alone yeah. all the mm-hmm. time? Yeah. You know, like, none of you care about that at all. I- that, that truly surprised me, though. We have Ryan saying to the girls, no, it's dangerous out there. Mm-hmm. You can't go out. You can't do this. You can't do that. And they let Del bring in the supplies they need. On his own. On his own. With a wheelbarrow. (laughs) Come on. Just, it doesn't make much sense to me. The the logic is always, is sometimes lacking anyway. Plus, plus with how far of a walk that is. Yeah. Why on earth would he walk that with a wheelbarrow? Well, we already know they use the excuse (laughs) of it's too dangerous just when it's convenient for them. Right. (laughs) Well, clearly it was too dangerous. I mean, yeah, but they, it, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to get this scene and have this, you know, whole thing play out if, yeah. if Dal hadn't been going off on his own, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, still, poor Dal. Then to be accosted by the girls, he gets back. Mm-hmm. Oh. We'll say this, I love the makeup of the gulls. I love their look. Yeah, I do. I thought they looked fantastic. It was just really nice to actually take a couple minutes with another tribe yes. you know and just see them and how they i was like oh my gosh this is gorgeous this makeup someone put a lot of thought into your design mm-hmm. yes and i just thought it was gorgeous that's all yeah troublesome just trying to sleep yeah. in that stuff but it's gorgeous you look great all of you look great <laughs> gonna fly away with them eyelashes but it'll be okay uh and with the oh. bird head on her <laughs> Like your eyelids must be so tired carrying that weight. <laughs> they look great, but oh my word, that's a lot of effort. A lot of effort, you guys. But yeah, you're right. It's really, really nice to see just that moment of interaction with another tribe that isn't a big mob. Yeah. And you in that scene, you know they're not operating on logic. No, it doesn't make sense to attack Dal and destroy the food. Um because they're mad. But when even when they see that he was telling the truth, that it was just milk. Does, does that make them go, oh, oh okay, we're sorry. We no. thought you were lying. No, they still want to attack him. So they are not mm-hmm. operating on any sort of logic. No, not no. They're, just, they're just mad at these mall rats who've been bossing them around and lying to them. So they just wanted an excuse to accost him. They found him. He was alone. It was an opportunity. He's an easy target. Yep. Because, sorry, but they would not have done it if that would have been Alice with that wheelbarrow. Maybe not. At the same time, you know, like, the way that their emotions are, they may have confronted yeah. her, but I don't think it would have gotten to that <laughs> point because Alice would have nope. not allowed it to get to that point. No. It just would not have gone, it wouldn't have gone down the way they would have liked. <laughs> right, like, she would have been like, go ahead, go ahead, check, go ahead, go do it, do it, I dare ya. <laughs> I dare you. Yeah, <laughs> you want some? <laughs> you go ahead and do, do that, it. and then I'll beat you for as long as it took me to grow it. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, we're making her so much more violent right she's now. She's not, but I'm just saying she's had her moments. Okay, if they attacked her, she would definitely have done them in. Yes, we know that, exactly. yeah, and it's confirmed. She, she, she would have given the goals flying lessons. Yeah, like she wouldn't have ever start a fight herself with them. No, but if they're gonna attack her, <laughs> exactly, you know. They might yeah. have the chance to overpower her, but she's taking a lot of them down with her. Mm-hmm. She'll never start the fight, but she'll finish it. She will finish yeah. it. She better, you better hope I don't get back up. <laughs> exactly. You better make sure that I am down. Chloe and Patsy <laughs> deciding to latch on to Dal. Poor <laughs> <laughs> boy. Thing ever. You know, I gotta say, they did a pretty good job. They did. Just e- even the light bulb moment the yes. girls have when they realize, oh my gosh, Dal's a boy. <laughs> he's a boy. He needs us to take care of him. <laughs> you know, he is, he's also very perfect for their first crush because most yeah. young girls, um, they are not, it's, it's not sex. That's not what they're no, attracted no. to. They're too young for that. They're looking for a c- cute, sexless, you know, that that's part of the draw, you know, the fact that <laughs> Yeah. It, the idea stay. of a boyfriend. Right. You know, there's no threat there and there's no um 
complicated emotions that they're not prepared to deal with. It's why there's always a baby face in every boy band. He's there mm-hmm. for the 10 year olds. You know what I mean? And then of course you have to have the, the old man in the group and that's right. for the older girls. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and all the other boys are in between. Uh, so yeah. I thought they did a good job and it made sense for the girls yeah. to latch on to Dow. And Cause he is safe. And even, they know him and they know that he's, he's safe. He's to, nice. Yes, he isn't going to want to hurt them or be mean to him, them. You know what I mean? But what are they going to do when they realize that only one of them can be his girlfriend? <laughs> Eh, flip a coin. Flip a coin. Patsy loses and throws a fit. It's fine. I do believe at one point they decide we we could try sharing him. <laughs> yeah. You can't share toys uh, very well, girls. Come on. No, let alone boys. <laughs> then they start beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do, I just, it all makes sense. And I, I think they did a pretty good job without it being creepy or gross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, no, it, it made sense sense for their age. Absolutely, you know, because uh, a lot of young girls do like latch on to like their older brothers, you know. Yeah, or, or their friends. Yes, you know. Uh, <laughs> and and Dal is very much the safe bet. He's in their home. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's basically your big brother's it, best friend. Yeah, and it just it yeah it's oh boy, he's in for some fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> They also play it very safe. Like, yeah. the way Dal's written to respond to the girls, one, he's meant to be clueless. Mm-hmm. That helps. Two, he's still nice. He's not being a jerk to them. So you're reminded as to why the girls are drawn to him. And they never once dabble with the idea that Dal would return these affections. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, they never, they never tow that line. Not even with a flirtatious look that might be no. misinterpreted. Dal is always, it's very clear, there's a line, he doesn't even know what the girls are doing for the longest time. And yeah. and I was like, they handled that really well, without making Dal be a jerk, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's nice to see that they can make him, well, unaware of the fact that these girls are growing up and into him. <laughs> well, remember, most people forget Dal exists. I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't expect yeah. him to pick up on and, it either. <laughs> and in his eyes they're little children yeah exactly because at that age you know the age different from the older person's view is so much bigger than the other way around and he's not really around much anymore to kind of see them changing in you know getting older and uh like he's at the farm so much he's just not there Mm -hmm. so yeah if they really wanted to get his attention they should have gone to ellie for advice oh uh, but if if they wanted his attention, Ellie might have been able to give them actual pointers instead of Celine. But Celine will just try to keep him safe. That's true. It has to do with trust. It has to do with trust. Yeah. You know, they already feel slightly embarrassed about their mm-hmm. youth. Yeah. And it's not something they really want to share with people because it just reminds them that we're little girls and we don't want anyone to look at us mm-hmm. like we're little girls. We want to come across like we know what we're doing. So you're not going to share that with someone who already has made you feel embarrassed about it, which Ellie has done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. She told him to grow up. But Celine is definitely much more of a mother or auntie figure to them. It's okay to express that to her because they know she's not going to make them feel bad about it at all, you know. So Mm -hmm. they would never go to Ellie because she's already teased them about this. Mm So it's like not wanting one of your older siblings who makes fun of you all the time. You're not going to tell them something like that because you're just sure they're going to make fun of you. You know, you would take it to an adult you actually do trust and no won't do that to you. And like you said, of course, Celine's only her only she would just want to keep them safe and would discourage it, you know, in the gentlest way she could. uh, I mean, even Danny teased them, you know? Yeah. Though I'm gonna give Danny props. I know she tried. Like, she doubt she tr- they at least tried to show Danny being nice to someone about mm-hmm. something that had nothing to do with the things that Danny cares about. It actually feels very out of character for her yes. to be so nice to the girls and be so gentle and not dismissive. You know, she does not mock them or call them ridiculous no. or act like they're silly. You know, she's sensitive to the fact that. Oh, okay. You're, you know, you, of course you want to go out. And even, you know, 
She just simply says, if you can't say something nice, say nothing. And she just says, I'm sorry. That's a shame for you because you wanted to do that. You know what I mean? I was yeah. like, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nice. Strike me okay, down, so you're but I agree. Okay, nice, Danny. I'm glad yeah. to see that. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I agree. I was like, oh, okay. It was like it was like an older sister. You know what I mean? Just being like, oh, like boys. It was quite out of you character. Know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even the even the sweetie comment, I was like, huh? Yeah. Really? That's this is not Danny's line. This is the first here. time she had a conversation where her voice remained <laughs> calm. She didn't raise her voice. She didn't yell for no mm-hmm. reason. I think even Bray was like, uh Yeah, it threw <laughs> me out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who are you and what have you done with Danny? Yeah, this isn't Danny. <laughs> feel like that's the reaction Amber would have had, though. What threw me was that Danny actually showed any sort of care yeah. or effort in something that someone else cared about. Yeah. Because she doesn't do that. So that's mm-hmm. what hooked me. It, I don't expect Danny to always be, like, calm and sweet and stuff like that. I, I, that's not... She doesn't have to be that to be a likable character. It's that she showed an actual, like, oh, this is what the girls are interested in. She intuits what it is the girls want to do, engages them in a conversation with, about it, actually acts, she validates how they feel and is nice about it. And yeah. it's like, wow, I didn't know you were capable of that, oh. honey. But kudos to the writers for giving you a moment. <laughs> kudos to the writers Yay. for giving her a moment with anyone other than Bray. Mm hmm. <laughs> He had well, to still be there. Of course. <laughs> yeah. I know, but he wasn't okay. part of the conversation. He didn't, I don't even think he, he was knew, right there. I don't even think he knew what they were talking about because he was just like, oh, oh, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was very good at staring into space blankly. Yes. It, it's like, oh, girl talk, let's tune That's it exactly out. Exactly what it seemed like. <laughs> Which, in all honesty, it's fitting for a guy his age. <laughs> Yeah, no. It was for sure. it was even weird to see Danny be the first one like to downplay what's going on everywhere else. Like to be the mm-hmm. positive one like oh it's fine, everything's fine, only to have Dal run in and say what happened. Mhm. I was even that was out of character for her. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I liked it. That's all I can say is like it doesn't match Danny. It's not the Danny you presented to me, but hey, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. Like I said, strike me down now, but I agree. It was a nice moment to actually see, you know, her be a human. Like, <laughs> to her have a human interaction with these young girls, and it was fitting for the moment, even if it wasn't fitting mm-hmm. for the character, you know. Uh, mm. For her. Yeah, it was one of the rare moments I actually liked her embrace like being in the same space mm-hmm. uh, because it did feel like a human conversation yeah. between two people that wasn't about the laws of the city or them forcing the idea that these two are deeply into each other. They were just talking uh, normally and it was just nice to see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> even yeah. even Bray being distracted and not hyper-focused on Danny, just, mm-hmm. just in his own world. And she's not whining next to him trying to get his attention. She's able to sit at a table with him and it's, they're just, people i i yes i liked it it was just nice <laughs> to see these two devoid of any melodrama in this moment mm-hmm. okay let's move on to the big ticket items of the episode sit down sit down and shut up what the hell do you think you were doing in there nothing don't you think that poor girl suffered enough during the last few days without you trying to take advantage of her she had it come into her you don't know her as well as i do maybe not and I'm sure getting to know you a lot better. Alice confronts Lex when she finds him gloating to Ebony and physically removes him from her room. But she also tells him that he should know better after everything that he's been through. And okay, first question here, panel, is is this not just calm off when Ebony did the same to Lex when he was at his lowest? I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, when I was watching the scene, I was thinking to myself how... It's not right what Lex is doing, and Mm -hmm. Alice is right to call him out. But at the Mm -hmm. same time, I'm not going to feel sorry for Ebony that he's doing it to her because it is the exact same thing she's done to him. Kick someone when they're at their lowest. It is karma. And it's that unfortunate cycle that he and Ebony will always be in where they're getting back at each other for treating each other this way whenever Mm -hmm. they are at their lowest. And then both of them have the nerve to be surprised that, yeah. hey, you held a grudge, you know? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So no, it's not right that he's doing this to her, but it is exactly what she's earned because she's done the exact same thing. So I'm not like feeling sorry for her. That doesn't mean I'm giving him a pat on the back for being a dick, you know? Agreed. Yeah. Like I get why he feels the way he does. Of course he's going to feel this way. She did this to him. Yeah. I understand where his anger and frustration is coming from. And it, he's going to want to take this cheap shot at her. And I'm not going to say he's wrong for feeling that way. But Alice is right. Dude, you should have learned from your experience not to do this because you know exactly how it feels, you know? And it does just no go, you know, go to show that Lex really has a hard time learning his lessons, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he struggles with that, you know? Even when it literally slaps him in the face. Like, mm-hmm. he doesn't get it. Um still just out you know for himself most of the time but it is just casually causing yeah, trouble in this episode exactly that's all it is yeah. it's him just he's bored so he's like all right let's go see what i can do you know uh good for alice um and and stopping him i think it was great that it was alice that did it um, yeah. i don't think it would have had the effect or the impact if anybody else even ryan you know i think it, it was perfect that it was alice um I like that she's the one trying to get him to see that he can be better because she can see that he can be better. So if Alice can see it, you know, it's, it's got to be there, but he's got to see it in himself. Because it wouldn't have had the same effect by far if it had been Bray. And it had been anybody else. Like, like I said, even with Ryan, you know? No, but specifically, you know, specifically, if it had been Bray telling him to lay off Ebony... He would have just had more comments about that. Yeah. I think Alice, why she's able to have the effect on Lex, um, the way she does, is there's a numerous, there's numerous reasons. In many ways, Alice is a conundrum for Lex. You know, she's a female, mm-hmm. but she doesn't fit into his box yes. of what he thinks females are supposed to be. And he both is afraid of that, but also becomes fascinated by it. I also believe Lex does respect strong women, yeah. especially when they force that respect out of him. He always respected Amber. You know, even though mm-hmm. he's going toe to toe with her, he respected her. Um, and Alice also manages to balance. Um, basically, she reminds me of Ryan and Amber. If you put them together, like you, you need someone who will support you and tell you you are capable of doing well. You're not a complete loser. You just need to try. And so he needs that support from someone. And Alice manages to give him that, but she isn't afraid to call him out on his BS. And, you know, she doesn't enable him, at least not in this stage in their relationship. Mm -hmm. And so her words have an effect on him. You know, she manages, because you guys said, anybody else who called him out for saying this to Ebony, it wouldn't have affected him. He just would have lashed Mm -hmm. out. And instead, she says it, and it makes him think. Yeah, she tells him, Lex, you are being a dick, absolutely. But being a dick right now doesn't have to define who you are. Yeah. You get to choose who you're going to mm-hmm. be. You cho- If you choose to be a jerk, that's all you can be. But if you choose differently, you can be something else. Why don't you care? And he actually looks almost confused. Like, why should I care? You know? And because you can see he's trapped in his own whirlpool of nothing can change. I can't be better. Nothing will be better. And she's like, dude, you're the only one who can make it better. And he's, he seems uh, taken aback by that. Like Mm -hmm. you're telling me I, I could make things better for myself. (laughs) Yeah. But there's hardly anyone who's ever able to just, who tells Lex things the way they are. Alice is clear about what she says. And it's just, there are no double intentions. She says what she says and she means it. And she's never pulled her punches with anybody, especially Lex. Uh, He needs that hard love. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good dynamic for now, you know? Yeah. Um, Similar to the way, you know, you feel about like Tysan and Alice's friendship. It's it's good. Tysan needed that friendship. She needed Alice to bring her out, you know, a little bit. Um, And I think that uh, Lex needs Alice to mellow him out really put him in his place and mm. and she does a good job of it simply said everyone needs an alice yes brings us to the question like where do you think this kind of hard love from alice is coming from like do you think she would do it for anyone in a similar situation or, or is it because it's more geared towards lex i think alice has proven now granted yes in future her 
her actions will be clouded by her infatuation. But I think Alice proves enough that she would do this for anyone. anybody and anybody. Yeah. In the, in the tribe. We, we can see her tribe. do this to Celine later. Mm -hmm. Even Celine gets tough love from her later. Yeah. And I think that goes back to Alice being, you know, that big sister. Always yeah. being that big sister and having to do that with, with Ellie, you know. Uh, it is just who she is. She wants to see the best in people and she wants to see them, you know, be the best that they can be. Alice is also just very honest. Mm -hmm. um, she does not practice subterfuge. She doesn't play games with people. And she says, like, I, this is just me. Like, I call it like I see it. I say what I think and feel. And so naturally, yeah, she's just proven that if there's someone who needs help, someone who needs advice, someone she sees plummeting, she has no problem. Like, it's just in her. Like, she'd have a harder time shutting yeah. up than actually giving decent advice. Mm -hmm. It just comes out. It's just who she is. If she sees you're in trouble, she's going to be like, yo, I, I don't know if you realize it, but you're drowning. So, um, <laughs> like, so better start like, swimming. <laughs> yeah. Like, you better start swimming, you know? Um, because I, I can't jump in there and save you, but I, I can lower this branch. It's up to you to grab it, you know? And, uh, so I, I don't think it's Lex. I don't. Well, it's just who she is as a person. Who trekked all the way up to the satellite station to get the message and lost two of the dearest ones in the process? The Morats. Who found the formula, then worked out how to make it? The Morats. Who gave the antidote to everybody in the entire city for free? The Morats. Now ask yourselves this. If the Morats hadn't done that, how many of you would be alive today? And this is how you say thank you? With his finger on the pulse of the city, Casey initially attempts to warn Lex and then the rest of the tribe that a mob is approaching the mall. A mob orchestrated by the militia. Lex thinks they should leave, but Bray, Danny and Ryan instead opt to address the crowd and tell them the truth, while Tai San pleads with Ebony for help. And when Bray is injured and the crowd make their way into the mall, Ebony appears and calms them all with a speech about the selflessness of the Morats and how she's proud to call herself one. So but yeah, panel, um, we have talked about the power of Ebony's words before, but yeah, what did you make of that impressive scene? <sighs> Um, I mean, my first, like, okay, my first reaction when they're talking about and figuring out what they're doing is, and lower the grills. The first thing that should have been done is the grill should have been lowered, you know, like that would have been the first step to protect them. Um, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. kudos, I guess, to Bray and Danny thinking they could calm this mob, you know, I, uh, I don't know why they thought that, but <laughs> okay um um now and ebony ebony doing what ebony does right i i why did it have to be bray that that brought her out of it you know and, and you know as soon as tysan says bray it was hurt see it on ebony's face and you're like mm. oh yeah. that was it that was the trigger yep. you know and i uh, but it's nice though that it's not just this one-off thing right they set this up that's the trigger and then explore that relationship a little bit more her infatuation with Bray a little mm -hmm. bit more you know in the show um so it's not just a, a a crazy thing that happened um we've always known that ebony is good with her words she knows how to talk to people and she yeah. knows how to read a crowd and she knows exactly what to say uh for it to have been a switch like that like that quickly yeah that bothers me mm -hmm. I agree that it does. It is a very sudden switch. Like, I don't mind that Bray is the switch, but I do feel I am agree with you. It happens very quickly. Like there's no thought, like she doesn't have to think about it at all. Um, and I'm, I can't really defend it. I'm not going to come up with an excuse for it, but I don't mind Bray being the trigger. And I rarely like that. Some, you know, I rarely liked it, but I think it works here for Ebony since, when you consider what she, she, we've just learned about her and what Zoot did to her and how she was treated for having those emotions, who was the last person? What was the last emotion she was going through before she ended up with Zoot mm -hmm. having that stripped from her? It was being completely infatuated with Bray and getting her heart broken from him. No proper closure to that relationship. You could say Bray was the last person to care about her. Yeah. And the last one that you know, allowed all her to, to care about some, you know, like she was allowed to care about him as well. And she was allowed to show mm -hmm. that to him. Right. So I, I'm not surprised that when she's in this maelstrom and has zero control over her emotions right now, she is just in a hurricane of them. 
She cannot make sense of any of it. I'm not surprised that he's the one that comes popping up. And that she's able to latch on to. Right. You know, the last time she felt good or Mm -hmm. safe or cared for was with him. And that's, that's what comes out of her. And that's what she latches on, you know, and it's just like Maggie said, it, it is a good payoff because otherwise what was the whole point of that scene when she and Trudy are talking about Mm -hmm. this? It would have just been some weird thing mm-hmm. that happened in the past. So that that was a setup. And now we're going to revisit just how deep that infatuation went and how it's she's never dealt with it. She's never actually let go. And it explains it. Maybe someone decided this should be like, OK, let's explain her attachment to him and mm-hmm. the way things have been between them. And but yeah, it happens quickly too quickly <laughs> it's very dramatic did, did someone just need to walk into the room and Breathe. say bray's name like should someone just been like bray 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 that have broke michael like that, that's like the magic word it was bray was hurt bray was hurt yeah i mean i mean those are all f- fantastic arguments but isn't it like what you said? Like, isn't it like the whole healing penis argument? Yes, it, is. Like, why? it is in a sense. It is in a sense. But at the same time, I think it's more the emotional connection that she had to Bray. And like Liz said, you know, he was the last person that she was allowed to be vulnerable mm-hmm. with. And she was allowed to have these feelings for. And, you know, the last person that she felt good with. You know, I would totally ca- I would call it the healing penis. Uh-huh. I would, Lance, if she got yes. her happy yes. ending with Bray. Yes. <laughs> It, I think for me, for me, it didn't feel wrong that that's what suddenly snapped her into action because mm-hmm. I've been in situations where I was completely focused and out of it on one thing. But if something happens and someone would be hurt or needing first aid, I would instantly snap out of it, go fix it, and then just do what needs to be done. Okay, but... but. Had, you know, it been like, anybody like else that got hurt, had it been anybody else that got hurt, I don't yeah, think she no. would have snapped out like, like of it like no. she did. Yeah. But mm-hmm. she, she snapped out because just because it's Bray. But just the fact that she snapped out of it and was able to deliver such a speech so quickly, that's not strange to no, me. No, that's Ebony. Right? Because that's, that's her strength. Yeah. That's what she does. She resolves things by spitting things. And there's not a doubt in my mind that... When the first rumor started about things going wrong, that Ebony already had a plan on how to talk herself out of that if need be. Also, they have to, they have presented Ebony as a deceiver. Mm-hmm. We, we love her, but we also know you can't trust her. She's lie, 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 lie. Yeah. If they're going to have a storyline where she's supposed to be like, I realize I still love Bray. And maybe if mm-hmm. I, you know, become a better person I could be with him they have to convince us that she actually is in love with him Mm -hmm. you know what I mean otherwise we'd be like is she just playing around like where the heck did this come from so for Bray to be injured to be the thing that snaps her out it's their way of saying if there's anyone this girl cares about it's him and that's enough to wake her up she needs to do something because the one person in the world that she actually cares about got hurt Um, again it's very dramatic but Mm -hmm. But it makes sense. It's made to be obvious because even a nine-year-old is going to be like, oh my gosh, she got up because of Bray. Like she must care about him, you know, or whatever. But yeah, it's definitely like, oh, okay, that's what snapped you out of it. (laughs) Sure. All right. Okay. Okay. I only let it slide because of how this story ends. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Can we give Casey some praise as well? Like he... Oh, good boy. He knows the city better than anyone. Like... He really should get a lot of praise, but he really doesn't. Oh, he, he, he <laughs> doesn't. It's sad, really. This boy is a better scout than Bray ever was. My favorite thing about Casey is that his motivations are... He doesn't often have many, except when it comes to, I just want to make a profit. Like, that's Casey's only real motivation mm-hmm. in life is to, you know, get something out of a situation. And yet, he is always... Like everywhere, I, like I don't know why he runs after people or follows <laughs> them. You know what I mean? Like I never really know what's motivating Casey at any given moment. But I just it makes me laugh that you can have a character like Casey who who knows why Casey does. Well, I feel what he like does, he does a lot. It's <laughs> simple. He he does not trust. He uses people, so information. He needs to know yeah, what they're he uses up to. Information is currency. 
Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. I just, I love it. You couldn't get away with many characters d- conveniently being where they need to be like Casey without them being strongly, strongly motivated. And they can with Casey. They've managed to craft him that way. Yeah. That We don't question that he's the one who did this and has this information. <laughs> Come on. He's always looking out for number one. And he will just watch people just to know what they're up to in case it could go either wrong for him or he could make a giant profit out of it. I think whenever you need a character to just get something done or see something, it, Casey's like your best bet. You know, mm-hmm. like, oh, you need to find out where Patsy is? Casey will find her. <laughs> like, yeah. There, you need someone to know that Ebony has snuck off. Casey was the last person to see her, on and on. You need someone to get rid of the prisoner down in the sewers. Casey let him go with the promise that maybe he'll get something yeah. out of it someday. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, Casey. In all fairness, he's a better puppy than any of the other dogs. Uh, no one is better than Bob. I don't care what um, you say. <sighs> But props to Casey for coming back and warning them. Mm-hmm. Like in that moment, he could have been like, they're going to trash the mall. We're not going to be able to stop them from trashing the mall. And I'll get trashed if I go yeah. back there. <laughs> I might just have to pull up roots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but on the other hand, he might know that the rest of the city knows he's a mall rat because he's used that to his advantage before. True. And he still just I, go. He, he, he could have found like, somewhere to just wait it out. We just wait it out, see what happens. Right. You know, I'm just saying props to him, his instinct. And this is something that's why I go easy on KC. Because as much mischief as he gets into, you see who he is when his instincts kick in gear. Mm -hmm. And how his instinct is never to hurt his family, you know, or cause his family harm. So here he is. He's away from the mall. And many people would not have gone back knowing what was coming. But he did. His instinct was, I have to tell my family, <laughs> and they're going to, I don't have to wreck my room. I got to get back there. <laughs> yeah, but come on. He saw what happened last time with Tribe Circus when, you know, he, he couldn't warn them because, well, yeah. they were holding him. And now he has the chance to warn them up front. It's true. In hopes of finally getting some recognition for that. Poor boy never gets any. He doesn't. That is true. Casey does not get the recognition he should get for the things he does. And is he gets a much worse reputation than he deserves, you know, mm-hmm. considering most of what he does isn't anywhere on par with the worst <laughs> thing people do in this mall. And uh, <laughs> especially when you consider how old he is. I mean, you guys have a rapist walking around. And everyone's cool with that. But Casey's the problem. Right? So. <laughs> It does bug me that he doesn't get the recognition he deserves. No. I do love Ebony's speech. Um, as I mentioned before, I just think she does oh, yes. a fantastic job uh, redirecting the crowd and t- diminishing, like playing down what they should be mad about. Mm-hmm. Uh, very carefully skirting over the reason these people actually are mad. Like she, They know it's not just because we lied to them. Bray even said it. They're mad that we lauded it over them for weeks. You know what I mean? Like they're mm-hmm. mad that we not only we use the whole life saving thing as a way to manipulate them into doing whatever we wanted. These kids know why the city kids are mad. That's why they're so mad when they find out you've been lying. You know, um, it's bad enough mm-hmm. you've been using us. So I do like how she carefully skirts that around and makes it seem like what they're mad about is absolutely ridiculous. Like there's no reason to be mad about it. And in that moment, she is able to refocus them. And But I also am glad that she reminded us of what the mall rats have gone through. Mm-hmm. And that at the end of the day, I, granted, it doesn't make it okay what the mall rats have been doing. We needed a reminder of the mall rats at their prime. We did. We needed one mm-hmm. because they haven't been at their prime in a while. I needed to be reminded why I loved the mall rats. <laughs> I needed it. I needed to be reminded of what these kids went through. And it's like, yeah, you shouldn't be trashing them all. I understand you being pissed off at these guys, but destroying them is not the answer, nor do they really deserve that. This could have been, you know, French Revolution real quick. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That was my only issue with the speech. I I love that she reminded us of everything the Moritz have gone through and done. But then she throws in that little lie at the end. It was like, yeah, and we're going to regret it because... (laughs) It's like, no. Of course she did. 
<laughs> of course, I know, of course you did. Of course you did. I, I that, like that. <laughs> it was the smartest things you could possibly say. How do you spin this to your advantage? And I'm yeah. pretty sure she thought of this before this exact moment. Oh, yeah. Mm. I, I just like that we got like those truthful moan bit, those truthful story beats of, yeah, what, everything that they actually done for the city. Yeah. And then she spoiled it. Yeah, but if anything, Ebony knows that the best way to sell a lie is to have a part of the truth in it. Mm -hmm. She also knew, she knew she couldn't say that they hadn't lied. That's just it. Mm -hmm. It's not like she could say that we didn't know that you didn't need the antidote because people would still have questions like, well, it was brought to your attention. Why didn't you ever address it? Blah, blah, blah. You know, she knew she couldn't get away with that. She needed to give them a reason mm -hmm. for why the mall rats hadn't said anything about what was going on. And by martyring the mall rats and making them self-sacrificing on top mm -hmm. of the great speech mm -hmm. she just gave about all their good deeds, that's why they believe it so readily. Like you mm -hmm. just reminded us these people went to a minefield and that they went to Eagle Mountain and they lost members to do it. They made this antidote. They gave it to us for free. That's why it's so easy for them to believe that they would, the mall rats would experiment on yep. themselves. Yep. You know, of course they would. Oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> yeah. And if there's anybody they would believe, it's someone that actively tried to go against the mall rats in the past. Exactly. Because this wouldn't have come across the same way if either Bray or Danny or Tyson would have said it. They would have just been like, sure, right. You really think we should believe that? But coming from Ebony, who they know would just torment and torch everything and anyone she could if she saw a reason for it, it makes more sense. It's more believable. I do love how she says... They, I've done horrible things to the mall rats, but they forgave me. They gave me a home and I'm so proud of me. Because you know what? Again, it's just like Sabine said, there's truth in there, but the rest of it's all lies. The mall rats have let you live with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is true. They have given you a home despite all the horrible things you've done. But I just love the fact she says they forgave me because it's like, Ebony, even you know they yeah. haven't forgiven you. <laughs> that goes, you know, Ebony is good at those half truths. Mm -hmm. No? Give yeah. you just enough of the truth to make everything else believable. Because at the yeah. end of the day, the Marats have taken her in, despite every horrible thing that she's done that. to them. And they're and everyone has exactly. seen that. Yep. Yep. They've seen her living there. I mean, the militia knows this. They were horrible to her. And who came to save the day, from what they know? She went with Bray. So it was a masterful speech on her part. Mm -hmm. Um, even the way she handles the cr crowd in the beginning, she doesn't let them speak. She I shuts down their dissent. <laughs> uh, you're thinking, no, you can't think. You need a brain for that. Yeah. Just shut them down <laughs> immediately. And the rest of the crowd actually does pretty much get quiet, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, it's just very, very clever and well done. And w I know this is next episode, but I'm only mentioning it because it's relevant. What makes this speech even more amazing is that in the next episode, we'll find out that there was no passion behind it. Ebony didn't even care about what she was saying. She just said what needed to be said. Yeah. Went back to her bed. And went back to her bed. Like, all of that. Because she went into action mode. She went into action. And it tell, it, that is such an illustration of the survivor Ebony has made herself be. Yeah. That she was able to turn it on because it had to be on. Because she had to perform. And then find out, I meant none of that. I don't care about anything I said. I bought you time. Do with it what you will. You know, and Ebony is good at those yeah. little performances. And it is, you know, her, again, keeping up that appearance that she has to have. Uh got to appear to be this strong person in control at all times you know but the mall rats know better they know different she knows that they know ebony without gloves mm -hmm. and then of course i love the foreshadowing of you know Bray oh, yeah. and danny talking about like wow did you just see that mm -hmm. you know and what let's hope she never turns exactly. on us oh uh, yeah oh boy <laughs> <sighs> yeah well i didn't like that I don't know. I thought it was too. I don't know like the word, but like you know, I just, I just, yeah, I just didn't like it for some reason. I don't, it it seemed so it real. Did, it did. It definitely seemed like something I mean, that Danny would say, especially from Danny. Because she's already said. She has already, yeah. you know, <laughs> implied that she knows that the Ebony cannot be trusted. Um, and she yeah. also knows that having her on their side is better than having her against them. Yeah. 
Well, we know this whole section of the season, one of the things we actually complained about is that the challenge for the writers was giving the mall rats a good reason to keep Ebony around. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they just haven't given a good enough reason that these kids would keep her in their yeah. mall, you know? And so that's what they're constantly working on. Why would the mall rats keep putting up with Ebony? Why would they keep giving her home? Why would they keep concerning themselves with her? And, this is one of the better episodes in illustrating mm -hmm. why she's necessary yeah. um, compared to other episodes. We're just like, yeah, I still don't know why you guys have her there. <laughs> just yeah. out, yeah. you know? She's but not just necessary for them. She could be such it's a threat to them. <laughs> yeah. There's no one who could in their mind right now could pose a bigger threat than having Ebony against yeah. him. Cause that would be so dang. Cause Ebony could have just as easily been leading that mob. Yeah. Yeah. And they would have followed her. No Absolutely. questions asked. We could see her holding, you know, pitchforks, torches, or well, making other people hold out, hold them for her. But And by also having the contrast of having Bray and Danny actually attempt to address the mob and mm -hmm. then having Ebony be the one who's yeah. able to stop them. Yeah. Once they're inside the mall, there's nothing to stop them from doing what they want to do. Except Ebony literally just walks in and commands the room, and nobody said everybody mm -mm. stops. Even the mall rats stop and listen to her. And having that contrasted with Bray and Danny, who are supposed to be the leaders of the city, for, you know, for the most part, have no effect on these kids. Mm -hmm. To the point, these kids would try to physically assault yeah. them in their attempt. Um, it's also just a really good visual illustration that you guys are pretty freaking useless without her mm -hmm. when it comes to controlling this place. Yeah, they need a strong leader. And, well, she's the strongest voice out there right now. I'd like them to give us to Danny, like, at least to given her a voice. Mm -hmm. Because now that, like I said, now that the virus storyline is going down the wayside, Danny will start to be less important and just kind of brace sidekick next yeah. to him. Like, mm -hmm. I just feel like the way she has pushed herself forward, she's the one who would have addressed that crowd, you know? But mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I just feel like this is where she starts to, they don't have much for her to do. And so she's always just kind of next to Bray, bolstering Bray. And I don't know, like, why didn't you have her try to address that um, crowd? Let I think this is where she starts to differ a lot from Amber. Mm -hmm. Amber would have addressed the crowd. You know, she wouldn't have, but then again, it probably wouldn't have gotten to the point that it was if Amber was still around. <laughs> no. no. I just think they established her as someone who would yeah. do all that. They, they shoved it down mm -hmm. our throat. And that's the kind of person Danny was. And then to have her become this submissive. Right. You know, and just be like, what do you think we should do, Bray? You need to say something, Bray. You know, he's only like, been saying what you've tell, what, been telling him to say, Danny. Right. You know, you had no say, yeah. problem telling people. Bray's been pushed down so much this season. Yeah. Like, he's it's weird. Right. And so when they have the opportunity to let Danny be this person now that she doesn't have to worry about the virus and all that crap and has earned her place of leadership, for better or worse, they don't let her be a leader. Hmm. Now she's back to bolstering Bray. And it's just a shame. It's like they ran out of things to do with her. And they know at this point that she wasn't like, coming back. Yeah. I, I don't know. And then they needed no to idea. make sure that Bray was this established leader, you know, again. No, they should have at least let her try. Yeah. It wouldn't have helped, really, because, you know, they're already dead set against the mole rats. And she's seen as one of them. Of one of the liars. So this speech could have only worked coming from someone like Ebony, who was once yeah. an outsider. But I just want to see of her try. Course, you know, and, yeah. and like, but you now they're, they're, they're having Bray finally take control again. And, you know, a better term. Yeah. Um, and, and making decisions and attempting to make decisions. And, uh, I mean, attempting, because he's like, <laughs> and he was like, oh, I guess it's going to have to be me. <laughs> That made me laugh. It's like, well, <laughs> duh, you are the leader. You to, I'm like, you're this the leader. Your this fault. is what you are supposed to be doing, Bray. You're the he reason we're in this situation. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. he literally looked around and was like, oh god, it's got to be me. I know. <laughs> oh, Bray. So See, I told you, you and Danny should have just run off together. Okay, like, like seriously. Who else is, <laughs> did you not realize that the buck stops with you, Bray? 
No. You're the one who told your tribe that we're going to lie to the city and keep pushing this, mm-hmm. you know, like, wait, you need, need to, and you were on board with doing that. And then when the chickens come to roost, you're like, oh, I, <laughs> I guess I should deal with it. Was he waiting for a mall rat to say, no, Bray, you stay here. It's not I'll safe for you. <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah. You're from the blood of Zoot. You have to be protected. <laughs> We stopped you from doing anything for the first half of this season. No way. Yeah, I think he honestly was waiting for someone to go, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not safe for you, Bray. If something happens in here, we need you here. I'll go out and do it. <laughs> Ray would be like, no, stop, come back. <laughs> okay, I want to say I think all this was incredibly well directed mm-hmm. and well shot. And again, well written. There's a great pace, the momentum, everything is going great. Even the tone throughout this entire episode, fantastic. <laughs> but <laughs> when Bray got hit in the back of the head, it made me think of a video game where there's always that one spot on the creature you have to kill because that is Bray's magic spot. <laughs> <laughs> You just got a judo chop him at the back of the base of his head and he's yeah. down for the count. <laughs> yep. It was a bit silly, yeah. Y- y- like all y- like, y- you think can- everyone knows that by now, right? When the can made contact, all I could see above the kid who threw it was like one of those Mario signs of like the coins. <laughs> <laughs> like you got 200 points for that hit. <laughs> you got a star. <laughs> the way Bray went down like a sack of hammers. <laughs> Just a side thought: uh, has has Bray ever addressed a crowd successfully? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is oh, not my brain, thinking. Wait, has he ever oh, actually had a successful? Mm, no, of, not really. Oh, hasn't. Oh, crap. I thought I had one, but I didn't. Really it was Amber. Amber. It was Amber. Season four. Fine. <laughs> Um, I maybe the closest he's ever come is when he pretended to be Zoot and he was able to put the guardian in stock. Oh yeah. Oh wait. Mm. Okay. Okay. okay yeah. But he wasn't being himself. Yeah, he, but it, exactly. yeah, and that was, it was and that was later. Zoot right. Who did like, it. So. Bray himself. And that was like, later. Himself did. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I, I don't Bray think he's pretending to be someone else. Ever different. I think the only thing Bray is good at is if it's already peacetime, he can give a sappy, saccharine, yeah. inspiring speech. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to trouble, oh. no, I don't think Bray's ever. I actually tried, Bray. I actually tried to think of one for you. I did because I knew there wasn't. So mm. uh, he needs, you know, he's that that person that has to have that strong female there because he's that, you know, mellow guy who's not going to speak up, right? He's got to have that female next to him who's going to be like, no, this is wrong. He's got to be there, you know? Mm-hmm. There must be one little speech. Yeah, the one, the <laughs> only one that's even close is the, the one where he dresses up as Zoot. That's that's it. And that's yeah. him just, you know, not being him. I can't do mm-hmm. it, okay? <laughs> So the one time Bray is successful in getting the attention of a crowd is, is this he had to pretend to be someone exactly. else. And not just anyone else, his brother. Hey, wouldn't that make Martin so happy to know that? <laughs> he's probably looking yeah, down, he's smiling. Probably like, huh? Here's you right. <laughs> see, he's like, see, I can get oh. it done, but you can't get it done. <laughs> Why did the writers do this to Bray? Why did they turn him into nothing more than a pretty face? That's what face? it was. That's why I said, you know, he's that, that, that arm <sighs> candy for that strong female leader, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Because he wasn't like this in no, season one. No, but at the same time... He was, a, he was a solid character of his own, <sighs> you know? And he brought yeah. something to the mm-hmm. table. I'm sorry, that's, mm-hmm. that's not who Bray was initially. I don't know why season two decided to turn him into that. Season two that. turned a lot of characters into certain, you know, <laughs> things. <Yep. laughs> oh, my poor Bray. He's trying, hmm. you guys. Give him a break. <laughs> <laughs> I will give Bray credit when credit's due, as I always will. He tried. He went and got beat up. <sighs> I'm still convinced he was hoping someone would be like, he no, was. Bray, he you was. can't. Because he was like, well, I'll do it. Yeah, of course mm. you will. You are the leader. This is this is literally your fault. Go handle it. I just love the fact that there's actually a pause before he yeah. says, I guess I'll go. <laughs> was he waiting for a volunteer? Oh, great. 
<laughs> like, why did it even take you a minute to realize it had He's to be you, He's not been Ray? with it the whole episode. Like, so far, not in the, you know, in the moment. All right. We got our digs in on him. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, cool. So that brings series two, episode 28, to a close. Thank you very much to the panel. And if you'd like to take part in a future episode of the podcast, you can send us a message over on our website, thetribe.co.uk, or on our Facebook page. So we'll see you next time for episode 29. Until then, bye. 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 Bye.